As teachers, when we see a student who struggles, it's easy to want to save them. But what if the right kind of struggle can be more productive than we think? I'm Dan Finkel. I'm a PhD in mathematics and the founder of Math for Love. I've come to Australia to see how rich mathematical experiences can transform the learning of students and the practice of teachers. So, you've launched the task and most of your students have gotten to work. What's next? Keeping students in productive struggle is a balancing act. On the one hand, you need to keep them sufficiently challenged, but not overwhelmed. But your first priority is to make sure that everyone understands the task and feels enabled to get started. Even after a flawless launch, you might need to provide some extra scaffolding for some students. You can only take on your turn a maximum of two counters, a minimum of one, all right? And the objective, the goal, is to take the very last counter, all right? So, would you like to go first? For students who have trouble getting started or who really need help, be there to provide guidance or help make the problem easier. Rather than thinking about what I take from the pile, think about what's left in the pile. Why do you think you wanted to check an odd number? Then how did you know that seven is squareable? For students who claim to have solved everything, be skeptical, demand to be convinced. And if they really can convince you that they have the answer and a complete solution, well, be ready with extensions or variations. For example, if I said 67 is it squareable, could you use your theory to determine whether it was squareable or not without playing around on a, on a grid? You understand the game. You're near masses. Congratulations all, right? But the next level is to be able to explain to somebody else how to be a NIM master. All right? You can use this, you can use the whiteboard, it's up to you. Can you, to support your claim, give me three examples? Okay. Yeah? Perfect. The goal is to keep students in a balance between success and challenge. Any well-developed task should include a list of recommended prompts and questions. Look these over as part of your preparation. And if you're not prepared with it, if you haven't really immersed yourself with the problem to begin with, then it, there's a risk of you really kind of finding safety in what the answers are as a teacher, and then students will kind of reflect that in their approach to things. While you usually don't want to interrupt the entire class while they're working, occasionally there may be an observation or an idea so vital that everyone should know about it. On those occasions, it's okay to briefly gather students together in order to share, say, a method of organization or some critical observation, and then let students get back to work. Sharing problem-solving strategies like simplifying the problem or creating a table can potentially provide a framework to help students stay engaged for the rest of the class period. And these are game-changing strategies for students to have in their tool belt. However, do keep your interruptions infrequent and brief. I'm going to get everyone to come to the front and we're going to have a bit of a chat about what we've learned. So just as you were at the start of the lesson, teachers, scientists, they have, we have no shame when it comes to making things as simple as possible in order to train ourselves and get the right idea. What if I made things even easier and said, all right, there's two counters. Would you like to go first when there's two counters? Yes. yes. Yeah. Let's give that a go, shall we? Stop for a moment. Some amazing work is taking place. Can you describe what you found? I found if you have a squareable number and you subtract it by three, it equals another squareable number. So if we have 25, for example, we subtract it by three, we get 22. Let's use Ethan's original drawing. This is five by five, so this is 25. You then eliminated four to make it one. Just a couple more minutes, go. Another excellent habit to develop when running rich tasks is to ask questions rather than give answers. When a student asks you a question and they're really sort of looking for a confirm or deny sort of response from you, in everyday life you might just be tempted to, to answer that question simply on face value, but what's really necessary I think is that you reflect the question back to the student. Is there any way to count a one? How do you prepare Count a one, as in like if I go first and I take yeah, one, can you count it? I don't know, is there? The benefit of not giving the answers is quite obviously that the students go down that path on their own. 
Often a student will come back, Mrs. Brennan, Mrs. Brennan, I thought about that problem and I have a solution, and that's really powerful. There was a theory that a student had about how to win the game, and that, that theory was incorrect. Now, it would have been very tempting and easy for me to say, well, hang on a second, you know, you need to change that, and that's not right. But um, instead, the approach was to use that theory, apply it, um, see it fail, see the mistake happen, and then have the student on their own accord say, okay, I've seen this happen, I've seen that there's a mistake here. How can I go about improving my theory? Another critical role the teacher plays is to make sure that groups are using and including every student member. Look for opportunities to refer them to work with each other, both to challenge each other's ideas or to explain things to each other. There may even be a mistake that you see, and instead of telling them about it, you can let them check each other's work and find the problem on their own. I want you to explain it to your friends because they might see something that you don't see. You're coming up with something really beautiful right now. Say it to Joel and Savannah, listen and see if you can refine his idea. Ideally, many students may not need you at all. One of the strongest choices you can make as a teacher is to see that they're engaged and not get in their way. If the group is actively engaged with, with one another, I let them because sometimes I can be more of a distraction than anything and I want them to keep on track and to keep communicating. To me, my job is done if that's what they're doing. So I listen to the sorts of dialogue that they enter into and that determines what questions I ask them or how much I intervene or, or leave them alone. The richness in rich learning comes from the recognition that students learn in the most authentic and profound way when they are engaged in a productive struggle with material that is at the appropriate level of challenge. The vision that students should always be quiet and listen as the teacher holds forth is one of the great myths of education. The classroom should be a place where students are engaged in a struggle, debating each other, engaging in problem solving, really trying to make sense of what's true. That is what real learning looks like. My dream classroom is one where I can take a step back and students are so curious to learn and so competent as problem solvers that nothing can stop them from engaging in their learning. In the next video, we'll explore how to wrap up rich tasks in a way that promotes ownership of students over their ideas, their experience, and their mathematical identities.